Right. And our last question is, what is the most important issue uh, to you in this election personally and why? I, I think the most important thing is that uh, we're uh, providing changes locally that are priorities uh, for people locally. Uh, we're building new schools, three new schools in the region at St. Gregory's. Uh, over in Trenton at Murray Centennial, a brand new addition there and a growing school and also a new St. Gregory's uh, uh, down in Picton and then the St. Joseph's uh, expansion in, in Belleville. Uh, you know, we're building the new hospital in Prince Edward County Memorial, which has been so important for the people of Prince Edward County since I was elected back in 2011. Um, you know, we're making infrastructure advancements in the region. Um, we're going to be widening uh, the 401 to six lanes, which is the number one priority for our our mayors in Quinney West and, and Belleville and certainly the people of this region, that brand new interchange, uh, the Belleville East Arterial Route, because we know we're going to see growth in the Belleville uh, Northeast Industrial Park over the next number of years. So that um, new interchange is going to be a priority. And uh, that that we're, we're we're creating the first conservation reserve in our province since 1999, and it's going to be happening on the south shore of Prince Edward County. Uh, I made a promise to the people of Prince Edward County four years ago that we would keep uh, Prince Edward County naturally green and turbine free, and we want to make sure that we're protecting that block of land well into the future. It's the last undeveloped. Uh, shoreline of Lake Ontario on the north side here in Ontario, and uh, we're going to protect that piece of land. So there's still, you know, a lot to be done here over the next number of years. Uh, we want to create good paying jobs with bigger paychecks, and it's uh, all part of uh, my mandate to make sure that we're making Bay of Quinty the best place to live in Ontario. Yeah, and the conservation um, reserve you mentioned there. So is that that? I mean, climate change is a big like. There's a it's coming from all angles. Um, you know, from from different um, na nature and conservancy advocacy, but uh, just. Can, do you think that'll help with uh, mitigating the climate, making sure that it's a good place to, or it makes uh, Bay of Quinney a good place to live yeah. and, and, and you know, breathe and work and, yeah. and everything like that? I mean, I mean, every little bit helps, right? And uh, But we are making uh, substantial um, changes when it comes to, to our climate here uh, in Ontario and, and focused investments in the steel sector, um, you know, they're some of the largest emitters that we have in our province and taking those three large steel making facilities, two of them over on the shoreline in Hamilton and one up in Sault Ste. Marie off coal burning furnaces and bringing in electric arc furnaces by working together with the federal government to make a targeted investment like that is going to reduce carbon emissions in our province by a massive, massive amount. Uh, then you talk about uh, the investments that we've made in the auto sector moving to electric vehicles and the hydrogen strategy that um, you know I released a couple of months ago down at Niagara Falls. Uh, the largest place where we can remove emissions is in our transportation fleet. And the development of hydrogen hubs is going to allow us allow us to to move uh, from from the big rigs that are currently operating on fossil fuels uh, to hydrogen is going to make an enormous difference in our province in uh, in cleaning up our environment. And then there's the whole small modular reactor piece, which isn't just going to impact emissions here in Ontario by bringing in that small modular, modular nuclear reactor, but we're going to be able to deploy these small modular reactors around the world. In coal-burning jurisdictions, we signed an agreement with Poland already to buy 10 of these uh, small modular reactors so they can get off coal. Um, this is a technology that is going to be first in class. Uh, we have a first mover status on this and countries around the world, including those who are neighbors of Ukraine and Russia that are currently reliant on Russian natural gas are very, very interested in buying this technology, which is going to clean up emissions around the world, but it's going to create employment right here in Ontario and our nuclear supply chain too. What is the most important issue in this election for you personally and why? <laughs> you know what grinds my gears, Nicole? No. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> um... My kids. It, it's really about my kids and their friends who, over the last two years, have been struggling. There are a lot in, of youth in our community suffering with mental health. Um, there's a lot of kids in our community who are homeless, couch surfing, 
addictions, um, self-harm behavior, um, suicidal ideations. Like these are very real problems in our community. And for the last four years, and especially during the pandemic, our governments with an S failed our kids. There was nobody reaching out to agencies and asking them, how can we help you help the kids you are serving? They're left on their own. There's nobody thinking about, how, you know, except for the NDP, how are we going to help these kids get those wraparound supports they need to feel valued, to feel loved, to feel heard? Because they don't feel heard. There is this idea that kids are bad, you know, oh, that kids, those kids, those uneducated high school kids causing trouble in our community. Well, you know what? Those kids have had some really hard years. You don't know their story. You don't know the challenges happening in their homes. Maybe they're not feeling safe at home. Maybe no one's actually listened to them. Maybe they have autism and because the portfolio has been completely destroyed by the government they are not seeking the services they need you don't know what's going on in their life so i like to say to people ask them how are you doing say hello these are good kids these are, they just had really crappy things happen to them and a lot of these kids are very um they're not confident that as adults <laughs> we're doing the right things to address what's important to them such as the climate they are mad because they know by neglecting climate up until this point that if we don't fix it now, they are going to pay the price financially and health wise for our neglect. So as adults, we need to stop thinking about us and our needs. We need to start making decisions that are best for our kids because they're the ones that are going to be saddled with debt and and health issues and mental health if we continue to elect a government who prioritizes the rich and the wealthy over our youth and people who just want to have a good life and it hurts me like if this is why i'm running because i see people in my community who just want to be listened to who want to feel valued who want to be cared for who wants their government to actually give up Insert explicit because they don't. And there's a lot of distrust out there and I don't blame them. They've been ignored. And so the NDP, we want to fix that. Me personally, I get things. I actually get things done and I have the receipts to prove it. And I will always prioritize youth, marginalized, oppressed, those with disabilities, ahead of adults who are white and able-bodied sorry you have a pretty you have it pretty good and lastly what do you feel is the most important issue in this election for you personally and why tough question i probably should have been prepared to to answer such a <laughs> such a question it's it's difficult for me to pinpoint between affordability environment and the education they're all so so important to me but i think i i will just drive home the the affordability piece one more time in our pledge for 19 different elements that will make life more affordable. Whether you are on um, social assistance programs, whether you're on ODSP, we're looking at a 10% increase um, year over year for the first two years and 2% thereafter. We know that that's not enough. And that's why we have this pledge of things like slashing transit fares to $1.00. Um, creating um, new equitable housing opportunities, creating 183 or building 183,000 affordable homes. But it really comes back down to affordability and ensuring that everyone in Ontario, regardless of where they live, has what they need to thrive. Because everyone has the talent to do it. We just don't have the tools in place. But one thing that's now being confronted by people is seeing 207, 208, 210 mm -hmm. at the gas pumps and what that is going to mean for things that are already costing a lot more than they did before. So at a time when we want people to get out and live, to get out and mm -hmm. build, to get out and learn, to get out and enjoy all that Ontario has to offer, they're being disincentivized by that sticker price and that shock that, mm -hmm. that they're looking at. What do you think can be done about that and what would your party do to help lessen that pain for people and encourage them to really start getting out and doing things again? Yes, yes. No, it's, it's definitely... Um, striking to, to look at the gas pumps when just driving this way down Highway 2. I think we just saw 206 or 207. It's it's definitely one of the biggest burdens on families to get from point A to, 
point A to point B. So we need to revolutionize not only our infrastructure, but our transit systems to ensure that municipal municipalities have the opportunity to move folks from point A to point B. Um, but the Ontario Liberal Party also is looking at keeping the July 1st gas um, tax cut that the Ford Conservatives have put in place. We're going to keep that. We're not going to eliminate it like some of my progressive counterparts, because that would cost families $965 a year. So again, we're going to go. I will go back to that affordability pledge. There isn't a whole lot we can do more when it comes to gas prices. That 5.7 cents is sort of the only thing we can do right now or in the first 100 days of office. But there's a plethora of other things we're doing to support families to negate the high gas prices. Okay. What is the most important issue in this election for you personally and why? OK, so this is the second time I've, I was asked this. Um, the first time I, I, asked, I was asked this, I answered mental health. I believe that um, there's been a shockwave of mental health issues during the pandemic, and it really uh, brought out how many people are slipping through the cracks, particularly with our opioid crisis and the amount of people that are depending on drugs just to get them through the days. That sucks. Since then, I have realized that there is a, a, a piece to this mental health, and that's um, our ODSP in our Ontario Works population. I think now I want to change my answer and say the most important thing in this election is getting the funding to the people who need it. And by doubling our ODSP and doubling our Ontario Works, we're going to lift a group of people that are being legislative, legislated into poverty that, that would have more opportunities and would be able to positively contribute back into our economy if given the opportunity, but we're not even giving them the opportunity. We're, we're just letting them wayside and deal with their own problems. And that's not going to happen anymore. I am not okay with that. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the, the question people always ask when, when somebody says we want to help people who are not working uh -huh. is, you know, but they should just help themselves. Yeah. How do you, how do you justify spending more people, more money on people who, uh, are not contributing? Well, first of all, the people on ODSP have been designated by us that they cannot work. So why are we forcing them into poverty? Because we said that they are ineligible to be part of the workforce. That's number one. And secondary, that um, people on, OD, on OW aren't necessarily people who are unwilling to work as well. A lot of people, especially during the pandemic, fell into situations that they couldn't financially recover from. And luckily, we had services like OW to help them. But realistically, the amount of money they're getting is not going to put them in a position where they can afford to pay rent or bills or feed themselves. There's more strain from us overcompensating in other social services to get these people on their feet than it would be just to directly provide them with a bit of extra money so they can be functioning members of society. You've talked a lot about health care uh, being a very important issue to you. Is that the most important issue in this election for you personally, or is there another? And why is it the most important, you feel? I wouldn't say health care is the most important. I think the issue that actually prodded me into this position where I'm actually running for office, which I never thought I would do, is related to transparency in government. And the way that the Ford government used the emergency measures to basically step around the legislature and also take away some of the charter rights and freedoms of the citizens. That was the thing that probably upset me enough to want to take some action. So I have some familiarity with emergency management and the legislation that we have. I was in the fire service for 30 years and much of that as an emergency manager. That legislation was never meant to be used the way the Ford government used it. That is a short-term solution for something like a major weather incident, an ice storm or a hurricane somewhere. It's meant to be put in place temporarily for a short term. And if it affects people's rights and freedoms, it will be only for a short time. Once the government extended that, and then they went further by extending the powers, even though they had canceled the state of emergency, and we're still infringing on the charter rights of Ontario residents. That became the most important issue for me. And I think there is a need to revisit that. When I was working with that legislation, I always thought that it had the potential of going too far. And I think the Ford government took it too far. And the worry is that it's too easy now to say, well, that's an emergency. I'm going to 
declare an emergency, I'm going to issue some orders, it's never going to get debated in the legislature, and you're going to disenfranchise all of the voters in the province. So I feel it's very important to look at that aspect and to get that under control. So what specifically would you look at to make sure that that does not repeat itself or happen again? I think there needs to be a harder time limit on that. An emergency, in my experience, a true emergency doesn't last for more than a month, mostly. You could come up with scenarios where it goes out to maybe three months. A pandemic, once it gets past the three-month period, is no longer emergent. You really can't call it an emergency. Now it's a serious situation that you've got to deal with, but it really, for the intent of that legislation, you really can't call it an emergency. Once you've gone past three months, the ability to move quickly becomes less important. And the longer it goes, the more your actions can be taken more deliberately. So once we got past the earliest stages, there really wasn't the need for the government to be able to act without consulting with the elected members of the legislature and thereby interacting with the voters. They took it too far, and I think we just need to make sure that we have more control over how that thing is used in the future. That was uh, an issue it brought up a time or two. One of our concerns is to try to get Ontario Hydro, Ontario Power Generating, and all the delivery of electric utilities to Ontario residents is way out of whack. We are the most expensive electricity market in North America. A lot of that has to do with poor management in the past by other governments and so on. But one of the big things that's drawing a lot in from the government is our efforts at using renewable energy. Now, we all know that reducing carbon emissions has been a big priority, and past governments have done a lot to try to bring in those renewables. The problem is it's not being done efficiently. Those renewables are not the answer. We have wind turbines that are costing us over and above the high cost of our hydro. The government is pumping in subsidies to the tune of two to four hundred million dollars a year to keep those things running. They operate at a very low efficiency. They might provide on a good day maybe 17 percent I believe was the high that I've seen and most of the time they're delivering about eight percent efficiency. It's costing us a lot of money. Those things are only hit and miss because obviously they're dependent on the weather. Those wind turbines are like really expensive big billboards that say, look at us, we're trying to solve climate change. And then solar panels, those things, I think they're a little more efficient than wind. They have about a 20 year lifespan and the majority of those that we're using, they've been made in China. The solar panels that are made in China are built in coal fired factories. So in order to save a little bit of emissions by using solar energy, somebody in China is puking a whole bunch of coal exhaust into the air. Climate being a global thing, one sort of seems to outweigh the other. Our view is that the more reliable and more viable non-emitting energy source is nuclear. And we believe that we should be taking the money that we're currently pumping into renewables and improve our nuclear facilities. Germany recently got rid of all their nuclear capability and they bought renewables. They bought wind turbines and solar and all of that is backed up by natural gas because those renewables are not reliable to the point where you can rely solely on renewables. They paid the equivalent of $580 million US in order to get rid of those nuclear facilities and put up those renewables. If they had spent that same amount of money on improving and updating and increasing their nuclear capacity, they would now have enough capacity to deliver all of the electricity they need for residential, for industrial, and even for future power grid needs for turning every vehicle in the country electric. Nuclear has gotten a bad name in North America. A lot of it is ungrounded. It is safe. It is clean. It is the better answer. So that is one of the issues that the new Blue Party also puts forward.